Hi, good evening. This is John Bennett from Miami. Dr. John Bennett of InternetMedicine.com. This is a, one of the series of uh, hangouts uh, for medicine. Tonight uh, we're armed with three distinguished uh, doctors. Uh, the speaker is going to be Jay Whit Whitmer from Mayo Clinic. He's going to present uh, his findings from a study they did uh, at Mayo uh, documenting the changes uh, from an app, an iPhone app for post-MI rehab patients. And we also have some guests, uh, Dave Albert, MD. He, uh, he tells me the father of M Health. Uh, he had one of the first big uh, medical applications, a live core, uh, and Dave's going to talk a little, bit, a little bit about that. And we also have Larry Creswell, MD, a cardiothoracic surgeon from Jackson, Mississippi. Larry is a real triathlete. You don't meet too many of those uh, real triathletes. He actually runs races. And uh, so I'm going to briefly introduce the panelists first. Okay, Dave. Well, I'm Dave Albert, and I have to apologize to my good friend who is a cardiothoracic surgeon, so he's a real doctor. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Dave. Very diplomatic. Larry? Uh, it's good to be with you all. Um, um, I'm not sure that I'm the real doctor, but we'll see how it goes tonight. <laughs> That's good. Okay, uh, and now Jay will give a, a presentation of some slides and then we'll be asking questions. For those in the audience watching, you're, uh, you, you can tweet questions on the tweet board and I'll bring them at the appropriate time for the gentleman to answer. So welcome, Jay. <clears throat> Hi, thanks, John, for having me. Really, really appreciate it. Really neat venue and really glad to share our data with you. Can you see the slide okay? okay. Uh, yes, yes we can. Great, great. Well, um, so I'll talk a little bit about some of the digital health things we're doing with cardiovascular prevention. Just want to take 10 minutes or so talking about primary and secondary prevention and starting off with some of the, the background uh, work in cardiovascular disease prevention and digital health. So there it is, primary, secondary prevention. And then I, I hope that I can get some input from the panelists on some of the unique needs for future research in digital health, mobile health, because it, it, it will present some methodological difficulties uh, moving forward. <clears throat> so we can't start any preventative cardio cardiovascular talk without, without giving the big scary slide. Of course, we know that a plurality of premature deaths in the United States are caused by behavioral patterns. When you look at the behavioral patterns that cause uh, these premature deaths, really the, the main three culprits are always going to be obesity, physical inactivity, and smoking. Furthermore, we know if we can treat these, quote, treat these, uh, these behaviors, we can improve cardiovascular morbidity and mortality in a dose-dependent fashion across multiple age strata. We're not doing very well with this, however. You can see from, um, from it probably, I guess, the third from the left bar, physical activity, uh, most Americans don't adhere to the ideal uh, measures for physical activity in a week according to the AHA 2020 recommendations. And then that middle bar there is really scary. Less than 1% of Americans adhere to the, to the ideal dietary recommendations by AHA 2020 guidelines. And these are not really stringent either. We do know that Americans are adherent to something and that's really mobile technologies, digital technologies is there are more cell phones and cell phone subscriptions in the United States and across the world than there are people. And uh, the other two take-home take uh, messages from this slide is that the broadband subscriptions, the data plans are increasing at an exponential rate. And finally, you look down there on the bottom, the households with Internet access at home. 2010 estimates have it about 72%. I, I bet Dave probably has some better measures on that. It's probably closer to 84, 85% based on what I've seen and read. Well, and I don't, I, you know, Jay, you're, this, the, the Pew Research Project has the best data. And mm -hmm. as we all know, the lowest socioeconomic class and the oldest Americans are exactly. the least connected. Right, right. Um, so that kind of leads into this that you know we can really have a digital impact in healthcare. Seventy percent of, of patients, according to the Cisco uh, recent data, shows that that seventy percent of patients would be comfortable with some form of digital health. And then if you look at the bottom, really about a fifth of Americans would be comfortable and would prefer to have digital health be the primary means by which they are taken care of. 
physicians are slowly creeping into this mold, and you've, we've we've got some really great panelists and and some of the leaders in the field. We know that most of us have a tablet or a smartphone, and we use it, but really. Um, only about a quarter of us use some form of digital health or mobile health in our day-to-day -day practice. And a big reason why, you look at some of the IMS data, about 44,000, and this is a year old probably, this data, 44,000 healthcare apps in the iTunes store, Google Play, really about 20,000 of them are fashion, beauty, veterinary, just they're not something that we want our patients really paying attention to for primary cardiovascular prevention. The 24,000 that are healthcare related, really only 7,400 are healthcare physician uh, oriented or designed. And we're doing a systematic review, we're about to send it in. Really, less than 500 of them have any type of data for or against their use. We think that, that digital health, mobile health uh, platforms need to be evidence and guideline based, just like everything we do in our day to day practice. They need to be user friendly, they need to be used by the 35-year-old exec up to the 75-year-old retired farmer. Incentives should be part of the operating platform. It needs to be flexible. Since we started this, we've had new lipid guidelines, new lifestyle guidelines, obesity guidelines, JNC 8s come out. There's going to be another set of hypertension guidelines. We have to, to make adjustments to the platform. Social media interaction is important, and then wide applicability and, and not being dependent upon a tertiary medical center like Mayo. So really two ways to do this, and I'm glad that Dave's here because he can really speak to the external monitoring and, and something kind of like they're doing here at, at Mayo with uh, Preventus and the bodyguard. The patient and the physician meet, there's the sensor affixed, and then the physician uh, reads the information transmitted from the patient, and the patient passively is, is given this information and directives. We went with a little bit more internal self-monitoring, and the patient and physician meet, come up with some evidence-based, user-friendly guidelines, the patient goes home and then they're really able to keep track of their own metrics and make changes to their health based on what they see uh, and, and experience with their mobile device. So we took the AHA ACC guidelines, took some Mayo, uh, CV expertise, we used a, uh, the platform is Hilarium, it's a service uh, platform based out of Dallas, Texas, uh, and we used some Bird Foundation funding, uh, a group out of Israel. Looked at cardiac rehab patients, patient-centered with monitoring and feedback uh, with daily tasks and educational material. This is what the patients see when they first log in. Uh, of course, they see the Mayo logo. Then they're able to see, <coughs> excuse me, they're able to see, if you look at the upper right, sort of their own individual profile. They can get help. They can look at the settings. They can log out. Um, the healthies are kind of a... Um, crude measurement of their excitement for the program. You'd be surprised at how many people, we didn't attach any monetary value to these, um, you'd be surprised at how many people really wanted <laughs> to make sure they had all their healthies accounted for. So taking you down to the bottom of the screen, the first thing the patients do is put in their smoking status, their blood pressure, lipids, their weight, and they're able to look and see where they stand from a cardiac prevention standpoint. We ask them to log in their dietary information on a day-to-day -day basis and then do educational tasks what does count as a cup of fruits and vegetables? It's something that, that really not many people focus on, and certainly we don't have time to in the physician's office. We take them to the CDC website, and they can find out what these things are. We ask them about their exercise habits, and then the patients are able to track this on a day-to-day -day basis, see what they're doing well with, smoking or in the green. Maybe they could improve a little bit on their physical activity. Certainly the diet can use improvement. Their medication adherence isn't up to par either. So this is kind of how we design this. Now I'll show you a little bit of data that we just published uh, in the American Heart Journal about primary prevention. We looked at an employer-based program. Patients were asked to complete this baseline health risk assessment, and, uh, and if they met all the benchmarks that I'll show you in a little bit, then they were uh, eligible for an insurance incentive and didn't have to report back. Those who didn't meet all of the benchmarks were asked to enroll in this program and given the, um, a 90-day follow-up. So here are the metrics. We asked them to be, have a BMI less than 30, blood pressure less than 140 over 90, total cholesterol less than 220, uh, manageable blood glucose, and the absence of tobacco use. So you see about 1,600 employees underwent the baseline evaluation. About half met all the criteria, half didn't. Interesting to me is that of the 836 that were included in the program, 200 never logged on to the system and just left money on the table. So I think that's that. That's one aspect of 
mobile health and digital health research that really needs to be explored. So we captured data on about 500 of them. As you can see at the bottom, very young, uh, predominantly female, predominantly Caucasian. After 90 days, we had reductions in total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, triglycerides, glucose, and systolic blood pressure, as well as BMI. And then what's more is that we looked at their Framingham 10-year risk score, uh, which isn't something commonly done in digital health and mobile health, and some, some type of conglomerate measure probably should be something we really look for to compare all these things. Um, we see significant reductions in the raw score and the 10-year risk prediction after just 90 days. So here I'll take you to some of our um, secondary prevention data. Again, uh, 800,000 Americans in 2012 had a, had a new myocardial infarction with half a million having a recurrent higher risk of morbidity and mortality related and unrelated to the heart attack, cost of over $300 billion to the United States, rehospitalization rates being a primary driver of this, about a quarter, 25% uh, 30-day hospital readmission rate. Even in Mayo, we have a 20% hospital readmission rate at 30 days. From Mayo data, we know that those who attend rehab session once a week for three months, they have a 50% reduction in all-cause mortality up to 10 years after the incident event. Uh, and here are the metric, or I'm sorry, the common pillars of, of cardiac rehab. You know, we want to have tobacco cessation, control blood pressure and lipids, really increase physical activity and manage weight through diabetes, or sorry, through diet and exercise. Make sure they use their medications, and then also control some of the uh, psychosocial factors such as depression. But we're really unable to harness cardiac rehab's power uh, and its morbidity and mortality reduction benefits as even at Mayo we have maybe a 55 percent adherence rate and that's one of the better ones in the world. Absolutely. <laughs> so it's something that certainly needs to be looked at and, and hopefully we're, we're, we're getting close to something here. Again this is our, our um, our online and smartphone based tool. So we had really a two-armed study for this initial portion and we had patients after their acute coronary syndrome or ACS who received a stent underwent percutaneous coronary intervention. Patients that started at three months or prior to the three months of cardiac rehab and patients after three months of cardiac rehab. And so you can see those underwent usual rehab with and without the program um, and actually, those should be flopped. Usual Mayo Clinic cardiac rehab were only 19 patients, and the, uh, the test patients were 25, so I'm sorry about that. Um, and then the other way, uh, and then that's correct. The usual post-cardiac rehab care just had 11 patients, and then uh, 15 it, who enrolled and started the program three, after three months of usual cardiac rehab, and we followed them for six months. So the first arm of the study, you can see those who used the program a little bit younger in age, uh, but really a benign secondary risk factor profile. A little bit of obesity, a little bit of impaired fasting glucose, but nothing that sticks out as saying this is a really high risk population, other than the fact they just had a heart attack. After 90 days, um, they had significant reductions in weight measured in kilos, reductions in blood pressure, and Dartmouth quality of life. Uh, we also had trends toward uh, improvements in physical activity, diet, stress, uh, as well as BMI. What I think is most interesting about this and what really spur spurned my interest and this is what I want to do when I grow up, I guess, um, is, is the dose-dependent effect of this. You see that the patients who used the program more frequently, and we, we measured that as total number of days they could log in, and, and on the, in the denominator and the numerator was total number of days they did log in. So you can see those who logged in more frequently had more substantial reductions in blood pressure, more substantial reductions in stress down there in, in uh, column D or in, in chart D, and then improvements in diet and physical activity after 90 days. Excuse me, excuse me, Jay. I, I don't think the slides are changing. I sure said, sure said something before. I was busy. Um, are the slides changing for you guys? No, nope. not for me. Could you please, please just check real quick, Jay, to see if you can uh, flick those slides? There we go. Now it is. That looks okay. good. Jay. I'm sorry, yeah. I should have said something sooner. No, that's okay. Um, I can keep it like this, maybe just not in the presentation modes the way to do it. That's the best way. That's right? good. Do it, okay. just go up and down the slides that way. Great, great. I, I can do that. Sorry about that. Um, right. 
was trying to get it all in. <laughs> trying to get it all in. You're doing an excellent job of explaining, and you were kind enough to send me a lot of these slides beforehand, so thank you. Oh, good, good. So just going back real quickly, after 90 days, we see the significant reductions in weight, blood pressure, and, and, quality, and improvement in quality of life, trends toward physical activity improvement and diet improvement. And then this is, is one of my favorite slides, really showing that as the participants used the the device and the program more frequently, they had more substantial reductions in blood pressure and stress and improvements in diet scores as well as their physical activity. And then finally on chart review, uh, we looked and you see that those who used the program had a 40% reduction in combined rehospitalizations and emergency department visits during the three months of cardiac rehabilitation. And, and I, don't, I have not been able to find any data that, that gives that outcome or to which I can compare. Um, but I, I do know that, that emergency department visits in the first month after, after MI usually approximate like a 30, 33 percent. And then, you know, the one month rehospitalization rate is about 25 percent. Certainly not additive, but, but I don't think we were that far off um, the norm. Jay, this is Dave Albert. One question. Yeah. The, only th the questions I had were twofold. Number one is, did, did you were you able to gauge if these people were getting stents the adherence to dual antiplatelet therapy because obviously we know that makes a huge difference uh, uh, for significant uh, bad outcomes yeah so, great, great question so luckily I guess uh, fortunately these folks were in the Mayo cardiac rehab so they were able to track medication adherence those who didn't use the device um, and, and that was 99%. And then the, the, for those who didn't use, and then a, according to the Mayo Clinic Cardiac Rehab database, it was 100% in those who, who used the program. And then the self-reported medication adherence was also 100%. So not a big difference in the two in terms of dual antiplatelet therapy. Okay. The only other, the, my only other question of your slides and I have to admit that I have seen some of these earlier, was that when I looked at the group, the one thing that seemed statistically significant was that the non-participants were 10 years older average, 70 as opposed to 60. Yeah. And we all know age is non-linear, especially when you're my age, uh, which is 59. It's, you know, 59 and 69 are a long way apart compared to 29 and 39. So, No, that's a great point. And then if you can also remember back to that same slide, and, and I agree, your point is very well taken. We don't have the, the, the numbers to really try to tease that apart. But, but I want to show this slide, which when you look at those who used the, the personal health assistant program, both during cardiac rehab and after. I don't know if you can see my, my cursor in the green yeah, and the red. We can. So, so those who used the system had a, had a reduction in, in the rehospitalizations and emergency department visits. And if you remember back to the post-cardiac rehab patients, there was no difference in age. Yeah. And so that, was, and so that would be comparing the, um, the post-cardiac rehab green, the post-cardiac rehab yellow and we still see significant reductions in that endpoint. So I think the age certainly does play a role. But and the best I can do is to look and say, age didn't play a role there. We still saw that reduction. Yep. So certainly the randomized trial will, will separate the wheat from the chaff here, and, and we're ongoing with that and, and looking to wrap that up midsummer and hopefully have data out. Oh, fantastic. So that's... That's the basic plan for the for the randomized trial, and and you know I I think it's interesting, it's gonna be interesting to to compare the results of the randomized trial to the observational study or the, the non-randomized data, because I'm curious if randomization really eliminates that much bias in mobile health and digital health studies, because the patients that that opt to do it, which is usually only about 25 to 30 percent based on my estimates from a systematic review. You know, those who do it, I, I don't know if randomization really eliminates that much bias. Well, uh, talk to the Simplicity Hypertension 3 <laughs> <laughs> about randomization changing outcomes of trials, but... This is true. This is true. Certainly randomization is important, but I'm curious just with, 
with some of these platforms and some of the things that we're working on. Um, you, you got us all excited, to be honest with you, Jay. You got us excited. You, you know, you, I bugged you a number of times because we all would like to have better outcomes. And, right. and, and, and as, a, as a mobile health person, I would love to have better outcomes stimulated by mobile health. And what I would tell the listeners here is that this, his results, Jay's results, Mayo's results, are totally consistent with some other fairly dramatic recent studies. One from Dr. Prash Sanders of, uh, that was in JAMA in November that showed that if you aggressively reduced weight versus not aggressively reducing weight, that you could significantly decrease AFib burden. And they just presented last week the same group that that uh, this this which was a dramatic study. So you know something that we all considered to be the low back pain of cardiology, atrial fibrillation. Yeah, we've got a lot of new technologies, ablation, uh, other other things, but lifestyle changes made a huge difference. And so you know, Larry there is a, is a triathlete. He certainly believes staying healthy matters, and I think. This is just another piece of strong evidence that what we have to do is change the risk factors aggressively. The doctors have to become coaches and that we have to really get our patients engaged. And, and that's where mobile health, you know, is going to be in everybody's pockets. And right. How do we use them and the Internet to get our patients to care about their own health? Not you know, I think you're right. I think you're right about that. And I, as I listened to this, I didn't realize we'd be talking about primary prevention as well tonight. Certainly, the people in the in the second secondary prevention category ought to have ought to have some motivation. The people in the primary prevention category are a little bit different. And I wonder about Jay's thoughts and your thoughts as well um, about how to get those people engaged in something like this if it could be done in a way that that doesn't require periodic or frequent periodic visit with the primary care provider to get it to get it going or to monitor it um, the biggest benefit would come from the the group of seemingly healthy people in their 30s 40s who who are at low risk um, or low to moderate risk, let's say, who could become engaged and really change things for the better over their long term without having to be in the doctor's office or the primary care provider's office to get that done. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, that would be the ultimate goal, certainly with, um, I guess I can get all this stuff off. Ultimate goal for for all of these things would be to to try to <clears throat> to try to have some means by which we can provide some of these healthy behaviors and, and a connection really to to patients as they try to um, embark upon these primary prevention measures. One of the things that I kept hearing in patients in the secondary prevention study was that they felt like this was a safety blanket and it was a connection to their to their physician. And so I don't know if you can achieve that same type of dramatic feeling in primary prevention, um, but I think that connection is something to always remind you that, yeah, you need to do the 10,000 steps or the 30 minutes of exercise a day. I think that's going to help, and, and some educational modules which really drive home some points where it's not this data dump of these all, you know hundreds of pages of brochures that we give patients as they leave the office. It's something that they can take in sort of bite-sized incremental incremental stages and steps. Uh, certainly the data on primary prevention for outcomes is not there with mobile health and digital health and Absolutely. for the lifestyle. Um, but I think that you need longer studies. Right. You probably need to look at some other metrics like, like Framingham Risk Score or the new ASCBD or something along those lines in order to quantify what's, what's working and what isn't. Well, you're absolutely right. I, I look at it, you know, we can't, mobile health tools are just a couple of years old. And so we're not going to, you know, it takes decades to develop 
coronary disease or atrial fibrosis with atrial fibrillation. These are decades long and I tell people in my company that we're not going to gain insights in 18 months over processes that take decades to develop. But Jay, I want to make one comment. I graduated from Duke Medical School in 1981. I didn't have one hour of nutrition education. That's a pretty good medical school. My son is just finishing his second year at the University of Oklahoma Medical School, and he had six weeks of intensive nutrition, activity, exercise. You, you know, um, you, you, Ken Cooper is a University of Oklahoma Med School graduate, and he is, you know, we should give him the Nobel Prize. Because in 1962, the guy wrote the book Aerobics, and he was so far ahead of his time, and the rest of us, you know, we, we just figured, like everybody else, we'd take a pill. When pills became available, we took a pill, blood pressure, stat. And quite frankly, we now all know it's, you know, I, I, I'm from Oklahoma. I own a ranch, and I tell people, eat more like a cow, don't eat cow. Okay, that doesn't go over too well where I come from, but that's just a fact. I think it goes over in poor country. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's secondary prevention and primary prevention. You, you've you got a shorter time, you know, you've got a shorter time constant looking at post, you know, uh, post PCI. But the fact is, they're just variations of the same story. And I think mobile health, digital, anything, I'm, my friend Leslie Saxon, chief of cardiology at USC, says physician guided patient self management, mm -hmm. getting patients engaged, having them do their steps, having them, if they have blood pressure issues, if they have cholesterol issues, take their medications. These are things that, are, that, are, that we really have to focus on if we're going to survive as a, as a country economically. And I think. You know, that's, that's, that's the way I see it, and I come from an area where we spend a lot of money doing ablations that cost a lot of money, and by the way, we have to do them several times to usually get them to stick, and, and it's, it's great therapy, it's great technology, but it ain't going to scale to millions of people, and so we've got to figure out how to prevent, how to change lifestyles, and, and your, your study is just fantastic because it gives me hope that we can do something real with these devices you know, I can measure a person's, I can, I can evaluate the rhythm, but can I get them engaged in addressing whatever the problem is? And that's what you've given me optimism. Thank you. Uh, on Father's Day coming up, I'm excited. <laughs> I was going to say, I think patients want to be engaged. And I was going to ask Jay, if not his app, what would, they, what would his patients at his rehab program be engaged with? I think about our situation here. The um, retention rate is low. Um, there are many barriers to getting a cardiac rehab um, completed, like you say. Um, but the engagement that you'd have would be with a piece of paper at best. And um, it's not very engaging. It, it, it just inherently, the alternative to, to something digital is just, just not, very, not very robust. And I, um, I'm not surprised that people would be, be engaged that way, Jay. Yeah, I, 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 unless you call a pedometer right. digital health or, or mobile health. So, I mean, some people, right. have, you know, their 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 kids might get them one, or you know, that would probably be about as advanced as as it gets. And you know, the barriers to cardiac rehab are really, I mean, it's it's, a, it's so many. And for us here in Minnesota, where it didn't get out of the fifties today, <laughs> and you know, the cold, the snow, um, and parking is a big deal. We get excited when it gets down to the 50s, so it's not so hot and humid for our patients to get outside. So it was a good day, good day here that way. That's kind of funny. A good day in the bayou, is that right, Larry? Right, exactly. We have the opposite going on here. Well, being doing medical school down in College Station, which oh, sure. there you go. one of the hottest places in the world, um, this is a different, certainly a different climate change, but, but true. They're just different seasons, different barriers, and different weather problems. But, but you know that everybody knows the stats. You, you were eloquent in repeating them. If you finish the 36 sessions, your outcomes are dramatically better, and we have a tiny percentage of people who finish. And so I'm thinking the NIH, everybody should be interested, really interested, 
and can we get, you know, getting people to come is difficult for all the reasons. Minnesota, it's the snow, you got to plug your damn car in in the winter, you know, the bayou, you got alligators. Here in Oklahoma, we got tornadoes. But the fact is, can we get, if not equivalent, similar results using digital medical tools? And you've pointed us that maybe that's true, and that's what's exciting. And it's also it's also the payers, the the, the Medicare program, the the big hospital groups, whoever's bearing the cost of the the ED visits and readmissions are also are the the beneficiaries, um, and they they ought they all ought to be um, interested in um, this sort of thing as well. Dramatically interested because the it saves them tremendous money, short and long term. Right. Those ER visits, those readmissions, and then the outcomes. You know, a guy coming in for another stent costs a lot more money. Absolutely. Yeah, Dave, I thought you brought up a good point about the NIH. And they're really, you know, when you when you go through the as I'm trying to to create sort of a grant profile and and become you know, move through my fellowship, finish it up and, and get junior faculty, there's not a lot of NIH funding for stuff like this. And and I think that Somebody, you know, an, an entrepreneur such as yourself, you know, it's going to come from industry. It's going to come from payers, insurance companies. Some we're going to have to get creative with the funding because it's going to take pretty specialized studies. And, and I mean, you can't double blind these things. I mean, you can't. You can try. I will tell you, there are interested parties. Johnson and Johnson is interested. There are people interested. Has put out a mobile health request for proposals. And you need to look at it because, you know, they've got to look at this. CMS. Yeah. Who did you put that out? Who, who, who did you say put that out? NIH. NIH mm -hmm. has put out a request for proposals on mobile health. But I would also tell you that part of the Accountable Care Act, I know that's a four-letter word to many people, even though it's three letters, um, it ha has stipulations for doing experiments about changing healthcare, and I think your data is is exciting. We, you know, you don't have to prove the value of cardiac rehab. We have to prove that we can retain that value digitally at a distance. That's what you have to prove. Not the cardiac rehab. I mean, that no one disputes the the benefit of those thirty six sessions. We don't really understand why they're so good. Now you've given us a taste that maybe there's another way and I think that's that certainly is is uh, something that needs to be investigated because it's I mean 20 percent you know when I went around I went around and asked all my all my interventional cardiology buddies what's what's your readmit rate and they said 20 percent and so 20 percent of 30 days that's the readmit rate they didn't have 90 day data mainly because I guess the government doesn't ask for it so that's dramatic and you you've given us a taste that there might be another way. Because it's not going to be busting people into the rehab center, that's for sure. That's been tried. Yeah. Too many alligators and too many too much snow in Minnesota. And too many tornadoes in Oklahoma. And too few and too few staff people to make it happen Absolutely. at the cardiac rehab. To be honest, um, you wonder if if digital technology in some way could replace some of the the face to face part of this be more effective as well, but reduce the 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 overhead um, and still be just as effective. Uh, Larry, by the way, this is a little aside, but it, it's relevant. There was a very exciting paper presented at Heart Rhythm Society last week, and Jay, you may have heard about it, in that this guy, um, investigator from Russia, injected Botox into the epicardial fat pad uh, like bypass surgery and eliminated post bypass AFib, and that got tremendous coverage. You know whether it's true or not, I have no idea. This guy's a real is the real deal, by the way. He's about the only guy in Russia I would trust because he works with a number of friends of mine. But but it's just the same notion. It's you know how many patients have you had who go home post bypass, develop AFib, drop their cardiac output, and have to come back? I mean. It's all about readmissions, and it's going beyond heart failure and, and uh, pneumonia here soon. And I don't know if, if uh, PCI and cabbage are going to be included, but I think everyone's going to be looking at the readmit notion. 
Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. COPD pneumonia, um, heart failure is going to be, heart failure is really the low-hanging fruit. I mean, well, sure. <laughs> and that's something we're, we're hoping to work on pretty soon. Um, and, it, and it was just approved by CMS for, for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction to, to pay for that. Um, now the real problem is seeing if we can get heart failure with preserved ejection fraction paid for because exercise is the only thing that, that helps those people symptom-wise. Symptom um, and that's half your heart failure population. So right. You're all, the, all the RV yeah. people are, are, yeah, no question. That's going to be a challenge, but some something that certainly should, could and should be, be able to do. And then you also have, you go to a VA population, you look at all the peripheral arterial disease. The only thing we have to, to help that and claudication really is, um, it, you know, from a lifestyle standpoint, is, is going to be walking. So, And smoking cessation, like you mentioned. Oh, absolutely. I, I can remember, Larry, uh, I know you know who Dr. Dave Savison was. Sure. As a medical student at Duke, he said, we don't operate on people's femorals or popliteals unless they stop smoking. Yep. Uh, that was his rule. He said, we just won't do it because... Uh, you know, it, it's useless. We're just wasting their time and our time. Uh, uh, you know, obviously that's an important factor. Right. Well, gentlemen, this has been wonderful. And Jay, you know I was interested from when you presented and, and it gives us who have now become believers, and I think everybody's a believer. Like I said, I have a second year med student son and they are, they've been dramatic at teaching him about nutrition and physical activity uh, as part of the holistic approach, whereas 30 plus years ago at Duke, all we you know that wasn't that wasn't part of any of our 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 curriculum, and so things are getting better. And guys like you are helping us, you know, hopefully see the promise of of beyond the walls of our institutions, and uh, to care for our patients. Excuse me, Dylan. Um, Jay, the, someone, you may have answered this. I've been running back and forth to the tweet board. Someone's tweeting, uh, what further studies uh, are planned? Do you have any further studies planned? Absolutely. Absolutely. So we're finishing up the randomized trial that looks essentially at the same question, um, but just in a randomized fashion. So more of a methodological difference in the, in the last one. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then we're also looking... At some of the, some of the, um, some international opportunities, uh, the Middle East. There are really only six cardiac rehab centers for the entire Middle East for 40 million people or whatever it is. Um, no, one cardiac rehab center in Qatar for like 40 million people or something along those lines. Um, so really underserved area in terms of cardiac rehab. Some of the places in South America. So trying to get this translated and see if this is something that can be used internationally is one thing. We're also looking, uh, we're also working to get this, um, uh, to continue this with secondary prevention uh, and heart failure and looking at uh, a big database of, of employee health because really the return on investment for employee health, I think the jury is still out. It, intuitively it should work but but we, we don't have that return on investment figure that's been positive yet. So looking at some things with employee health, uh, big databases there, and um, and then again more you know going after that NIH grant that that uh, Dave mentioned. We're working on that. So a bunch of different things in a bunch of different areas. And uh, like I said, this is kind of what I want to do when, <laughs> when I grow up. <laughs> so I, I'm I'm always looking for more opportunities and looking to see who else is interested. I, I have a question for Larry. Larry, mm -hmm. you know, you're the athlete's heart. Yeah. You're a triathlete. And a lot of friends of mine who are, let's say, uh, have crossed the threshold of maturity. And, you know, anymore, we, we look at them and, and my good friend John Mandrola, who, who's a big blogger, and, and, you know, John is a competitive bike racer. Right. and also has suffered AFib and been very public about it, so there's no HIPAA violation here. You know, we need to get rational when we get to be maybe a little older than Dr. Wood there. <laughs> and, um, you know, what is your rule of thumb for telling people what kind of level of activity 
they should strive to meet. You know, not everybody's going to be a triathlete or a marathon runner. So do you have any rules of thumb that can help people listening, you know, if they decide at age 50 they want to get, quote, into shape? Um, sure. Uh, I think the truth is that we've spent um, a generation or two trying to figure out how little exercise is needed to derive the, the health benefits that come. We've spent a lot of time and people all over the world have worked on that and that's really what's led to the, the, you know, the societies or the organizations and their recommendations for an amount of exercise which people ought to do. But at the other end of the spectrum you're asking about wh when does it become too much and the truth is that we really don't, I don't think we really know um, uh, or we don't know in much detail but, but I think that we will, I think that we'll learn. I think that it, you know, you mentioned the marathon runner. I, I have running friends. The the typical middle of the pack marathon runner spends a few hours a week doing exercise. That doesn't seem that doesn't seem excessive. Um, if it's excessive, it it might be just because it's done over decades of time. Maybe it's a maybe it's a a duration times amount or or something like that. The integral of some some sort that matters in terms of, of adverse outcomes. But there are certainly people and triathletes among them where, where the exercise can amount to 10 to 20 hours of, uh, of time a week. And I don't, I don't know that we really know um, how much is too much. Certainly there is a burden of, of a fib in, in endurance athletes that, that accrues over time. There's no doubt about that. I have to say I don't personally know what to make of the of the observations of coronary calcification, increased coronary artery score on a CT in long-term athletes. I don't know. I don't know what the I don't know what the natural history or I don't know what the outcome of that might be. But I think that, you know, when we talk about the too much part of this, we're talking about a very a very small number of people. You know, society as a whole really does need to worry about the problem of too little exercise, and I worry that the the headlines when we talk about possibilities and theories about the too much end will turn the <laughs> turn the masses off to the the idea that exercise in general is good for 200 different reasons. I mean, what are your thoughts about too much? Well, I don't. I, you know, you just said it. You said the right thing, and that is, I'm a I'm a I'm an I'm a I'm a workout guy. I was a college athlete. I was a wrestler. If you yeah. call that athlete, uh, and and I work out, you know, three or four times a week, but my recovery at age 59 is different than my recovery at age 39 or 29, and so I've taken that into consideration. But but the issue is not that. The issue in society is not working out at all. Right. So I look at the Fitbits of the world, and I I hope that if if I don't think they're I don't think can they motivate people to get off their butt mm -hmm. and get out and get active? Right. And if, if I see them as of any value, and this kind of relates to Jay's study, the value is you engage people. Did I move more, less, or the same as I moved yesterday? Right. And hopefully that slope of movement, of activity, of steps, of calories is on a positive slope. And that's that's my view is that you know I'm not gonna I'm not gonna dismiss the the, the the wearable craze that seems to be going if it gets people off their butts and moving. Right. And so I'm uh, you know and just like food. I mean we've got to we've got to help people learn to eat better. And and you know if we can combine that with activity, we'll make a big difference. And we need to be making that difference. When a guy like me, you know, in 15 years, when I'm in the middle of Medicare, uh, I need to be spending less money than we spend today because there's going to be a whole lot more of me than there are people today. And so that's just reality. So hopefully we can make an impact understanding that, that you know, Jay looked at short-term impacts of people that, that have, you know, secondary prevention of people that already have documented disease. And we've got to think about how do we how do we do primary, like he said, primary prevention. So, so Larry, that, you're right. I think there's really an unquenchable appetite out there for quality information and an approach 
to go about doing all the right things. I mean, you go to the bookstore, there is a whole aisle of books, hundreds of titles of books, and you watch people go through that aisle. They don't know what to pick or to choose or how to get started. They don't know who to pick up the phone and call for a, for a doctor like Jay to go see in primary or in preventive cardiology to get started down the right path. The people are on the internet constantly with questions at forums or emails to me or, or John or, or whoever about how do, how do we do what's right. And I do think that digital technology could play a, just a huge role if it's put together by thoughtful people like Jay um, and brought to people like you, <laughs> bring things to people. Um, I think there really is an opportunity there in the primary prevention end of things. Well, Dr. Google is not as good as Mayo Clinic. Okay, and uh, yeah. my wife's a rheumatologist, uh -huh. and usually, at least two or three times a week, she has to spend the first five minutes of her ten minutes explaining why gin-soaked raisins aren't going to get rid of rheumatoid arthritis. Right. And right. so, oh, but Google, the the fifteenth <laughs> page of Google said this will cure it. Right. And so, you know, uh, people need to understand that. The internet's a wild place, and if you want good information, go to the Mayo Clinic. I'll personal view. I bought the Mayo Clinic diet book mm -hmm. so that I could find out what the Mayo Clinic thought. And this is an un, I, I am an unpaid advocate here, Jay. So uh, okay, public affairs. I, I need to capture this and send it to them tomorrow. Exactly. Well, it, I I don't know if you knew Steve Hamill, who just retired. He's yeah. a great friend of mine from Duke, and and I. You know, we, we need trusted sources, right. but we need them also locally. Just what Larry said. What's Absolutely. digital technology is engaging people. It's better than a piece of paper. It's alive. It's interactive. And that's where digital, I think, can help us engage our patients and get them, you know, participating in their own care. It, it can, and we need a little bit of... Patients also will need a little bit of guidance. I don't think that there's one app that's going to be the silver bullet but you can't go on the Google Play Store or the iTunes Store and see 40,000 applications that you can choose from. You don't know what's paid and how much to pay and what's the, the return on investment. We, we, we need to make sure that we're looking at these and, and we have some people who have a little bit of expertise and a little bit of knowledge about this, this wide array so that we can instruct patients because I think the 35-year-old exec who, who is a, you know, a Delta Diamond member is going to be a little bit different than the 75-year-old retired farmer from from down the road here in Orinoco. And, and it, so, I, I, you know, there's going to be a behavioral psychology component that, that runs through all of this that I certainly don't have the background, but, but I know that there are people around who can start to look at this and we can really start to dissect what's going to be pertinent and, and usable and effective for multiple pe patient populations. Yes, it, you know, a doctor's going to be ready to, to answer, just like Dave said, uh, the doctor almost has to be aware of what's out there on the internet and curate the right stuff so that they're able to say to the patient, okay, I think you should go here, there, or, or give them exact maybe web addresses they can go to for valid information. Hopefully. I mean, I, I don't, I told somebody to, you know, there was a, um, Typically, females are a little bit better with digital mobile health, uh, and so I had a you know, kind of a couple in my office yes, Wednesday, maybe yesterday, yeah, and uh, I looked to the lady, and I said, well, I, you know, I would probably recommend a Fitbit for you. I think that's probably going to be your biggest thing. It's going to count your steps, and I think that somebody such as yourself will probably take on to this and be able to be compliant with it for many years, and the guy looks at me, and he goes, well, what about shop liver, and I said, no, you're going to stop using it in probably six weeks, which is what everybody does. So for, so for you, you need your wife who uses her Fitbit to nag you. <laughs> so it's, it's low tech, but but I don't know what what's really going to work for them because we know that that men <clears throat> typically don't adhere to these things for greater than about two to three months. That's correct. They go on the. That's right. So. You know, we, we all need to have paid more attention in our psychology classes and psychiatry classes and human behavior. I mean, you know, Larry deals with people after he operates on them. You know, it's very important what you do and his long-term outcomes 
are dependent upon, you know, unfortunately, it's not just what we do in the cath lab or the EP lab or the OR. Our patients, and you, your data says it, they can have a big impact on what, what their outcomes are and how do we engage them to do that. It's important. Stop yeah. smoking. Lose the, other, the other thing I'd add, Jay, you, you say you're going to the Middle East to find where there's centralization or too few resources in terms of cardiac rehab. You don't need to go that far. The, we have that we have that here in, in rural America, you know. Here oh, in yeah. you know, we're we're sort of the big city here in Mississippi, a state of four million people, but but my patients can come from two or three hours drive away and that's an immediate barrier to to um, to doing cardiac rehab and that situation would be common in other other areas here in the in the US and I and here there are all kinds of initiatives related to the delivery of healthcare in rural areas um, and I would think that, that would be another avenue for funding opportunities that sort of not um, what you might immediately think of but um, a more general sort of area where where funding might be available would be sort of rural rural health because it sort of has a, an application in that realm. Yeah, that's that's the NIH's uh, sort of specific Got call it. for their mobile Got health technology, and and it's I I think it's you're exactly right, low hanging fruit again. Right. And we're the same way in Oklahoma. We have a huge right. two cities, but most but you know that's half the population right. of the state, and the other half right. live in Godibo, Oklahoma. Right. And you cannot expect them to do cardiac rehab. It's right. not going to happen. They're not going to stay in Oklahoma City or Tulsa for six weeks. They're going to go back, and there's no gym even in those towns. There's no you know Gold's Gym or anything. Right. How do we get those people to engage? And I think digital's we've got to we've got to figure. You know, it's, it was telemedicine. That was a big, you know, 15 years ago, telemedicine, rural, rural America was going to be a telemedicine mecca. And, and now, this is a telemedicine unit. You know, I can do FaceTime. Right. We're all on telemedicine right now. We're the, the Google Hangouts, telemedicine. Skype is telemedicine. And that's probably way more important kind of telemedicine than the incredibly expensive Cisco kiosks. And how do we engage the patients with that to... Walk around the 40, as we say here in Oklahoma, you know. Walk around the 40 and uh, eat Walk a few expensive. And the other, the, other, the other funding realm that comes to mind relates to disparities in, in health care because of socioeconomic situation, which partly relates to geography, but that's another area where private foundations sometimes have an interest in in, in research efforts that um, can tackle disparities that relate to access uh, of, to care be another thing to think about. Yeah, I think, um, you know, uh, Eric Topol, I think he, he probably rallied his local congressman. It looks like there's something going through the works, um, and it's going to funnel a lot of cash to California 52, which I believe is the home, the home base for Scripps and UCSD, and I think they're about to get a lot of money for for digital technologies and, and healthcare, you look at UCSF. They just signed a big deal with Samsung. Mm -hmm. um, and Samsung is. It, I don't know the the particulars of that, but but I think that partnerships such as that, both public and private, are going to be pretty important. Um, and like, as you said, some of these private foundations in the West West Foundation, West Corporation. Yeah, West Foundation in San Diego. Yeah, I mean they're they're pretty pretty uh, excited about these things. So it's tapping some of this, and I don't, I don't have, I don't have enough uh, years under my belt to really start at knocking on people's door quite yet. Um, but I'm hoping to get there soon. But we'll see. <laughs> well, your day has been very exciting, and it's it, it's given me hope that we can do something beyond just you know tell somebody they're an AFib or sinus rhythm that we might be able to use digital tools to help. So I really appreciate the opportunity to hear your you talk and. Larry and, and John, thank you for setting this up. Yeah, thank you. Gentlemen, thank you very, very much, uh, Jay, for, for doing the study. And thanks, thanks to the panelists for coming. I'd like to extend the invitation for any of you guys to use this tool 
to spread uh, good dialogue, with, like, which I've just heard for the last hour. And I'm sure a patient's benefited by it as well as other healthcare workers. So thank you very much. I'm going to stop the broadcast and hang out. We'll chat a little bit after. Good night. Good night. Thanks.